Hello everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend the next 30 minutes with me as we look at helping students with SEN to assess learning. I'm Serena and I serve as Master Teacher for Special Educational Needs at the Academy of Singapore Teachers. It is heartwarming to see a diverse and large group of participants today. In this very short time together, I hope to provide you the opportunity to engage in reflective practice as you contextualize the sharing through the roles you are serving and the students, the teachers, classrooms, subjects, and schools you are supporting. The student, primarily the other in the classroom, the one who challenges our assumptions and boundaries is at the heart of my sharing today, which is based on my work with the fraternity and is not a funded research project. I surveyed teachers, 1,232 to be exact, attending my workshops and other professional development sessions last year to understand facilitators and barriers in supporting the student with SEN within the mainstream classroom. Recurring issues surrounded two key concerns. One, having to teach the SEN student effectively within a class of 40. And two, a desire to better support the student, but feeling a lack of know-how and inability to create perceived specialized resources. The two key concerns concurred with my earlier work during secondment in pre-service and in-service training of educators. Educators were interested to find out what they could do to attend to the needs of their students. A majority were not questioning why they as mainstream teachers have to put on a perceived additional hat, but they felt incompetent in terms of skills and knowledge. A myth that surrounded the two key concerns was that the SEN student needed specialized, customized support to assess mainstream learning. This information was inf very important because in my observations of classrooms, I've noticed that for any educational change to occur, the most important factor is the you factor. You being the site of any educational change that is to happen. So if the educator felt she or he was com not competent enough, the battle was easily lost. So a key way around this for me was to examine the beliefs we hold as educators. So what are the beliefs that we hold, whether as an advocate, a facilitator, or leader in providing intervention or pedagogical support? What is our anchor? In speaking with teachers, it is clear that beliefs drive our practice and guide our actions. So whether we are allied educators, we are teachers, educational psychologists, or school leaders, I would think that the common factor is the student at the heart of all that we do. Having this common factor facilitates SEN support. Because when we believe that every child wants to and can learn, we are motivated to ensure that each child in our care has access to learning. We do our best to effectively teach them and support them. This common language when articulated positively was a facilitator to SEN support as a guide and anchor. So having our beliefs articulated clearly and explicitly, the next part that was significant in my conversations was the diversity within our heterogeneous classrooms. So to help us contextualize today's sharing with a more specific reference point, let's watch a short trigger video. The video profiles Aaron within a mainstream classroom. Aaron lacks understanding of social cues and has difficulties expressing his needs and in focusing. As you watch the video, think about the key question. Who is your learner? Who is this student you are most concerned about? Who is this learner 
who you would like to better support by making learning accessible for him or her. Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning everyone. Okay, get back to your seats please. Thank you. Aaron, go back to your seat. Aaron. Aaron, sit down please. Aaron, go back to your seat. What's so interesting outside? There are some students playing in the drain over there. No, it's okay. Just leave them alone. The lesson is here, Aaron. Over there. We've got some kids playing. No, 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 no. Hey, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's he doing out there? Hey, everyone, please. The lesson is here. We have a lot to cover. Can you all please go back to your seats? No, 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 no. If we were to describe our learners with a short phrase or word, our individual responses would form a microcosm of the diversity in our classrooms, which is situated within the current educational landscape. Mr. Hakim's diverse classroom, which you saw in the video, is the reality we educators face. Is there a way around this then? So I went on to look at facilitators and barriers for SEN support. With our classrooms being so diverse, what then have teachers done to better support our class, our students, primarily those with SEN? Teachers have shared that a common language aids their work within the school. The beliefs shared were relatively personal ones or based on individual schools' core values. If we are to provide better support and transition, educators would need a common reference point. On a national front, the Singapore curriculum philosophy and the Singapore teaching practice are gifts that help us all sing the same song so all our students, not just some or most, are better supported as they progress from one level to the next and one school to the next. As our beliefs drive our decisions and our actions, the STP provides teachers theoretical understanding of subject matter, students, learning and teaching matched with the appropriate pedagogical practices across four teaching processes. So teachers have shared that as we provide access to all learners within our classrooms, positive classroom culture is the most important and best starting point. I have found that this is true, especially for the student with SEN. So if we delve deeper into positive classroom culture, it guides teachers in the key areas that would actually ensure that the classroom is set up for effective learning. So in a class like Mr. Hakim's, what would help is going back to the basics of building a positive classroom culture. As I explored this area further to understand the operational definition of what it looks like, feels like, and sounds like in our mainstream classrooms, I consulted teachers who are supporting students with SEN at two levels, one at the classroom level and two at the school level. This was done through pre-workshop surveys, as well as co-generative chats done both face-to-face -face as well as through telecommunication and online means. Using positive classroom culture from STP as a reference, I grouped what I was learning and observing into the five key areas. In the interest of time, I will focus on examples on setting expectations and routines. So in scanning the ground and understanding what helps students with SEN assess learning in the mainstream classroom, I was interested in searching for effective practices that we could reflect on and even replicate 
to strengthen our work. It was evident that teachers were aware of the need for expectations and routines to be communicated and most actually spent time in the first week of the new school year sharing this with their classes. So the what and the why of setting expectations and routines was less of a barrier compared to the how it was done. Teachers knew the intent of setting expectations and routines, but deferred in their ways of how they did it in their classrooms so that every student, not just some or most, were able to assess learning. So allow me to provide some examples for reflection. In the case of Aaron, for example, he lacks understanding of social cues and we could see that he was genuinely interested in what was going on outside the window. Mr. Hakim voiced his expectation that the students should be at their seats. But I wonder if he had communicated that explicitly to his entire class. So for a student like Aaron, what would be essential is to guide clearly of what is expected. If the expectation is visually a bit available on a board in front of the student, it is even more effective. So the teacher who did not assume that every student knows what is on their mind, intentionally and purposefully shared their expectations explicitly and ensured that there was consistency. So clarity in sharing our expectations is core for effective learning and teaching to take place. If every teacher does the same, the student is provided a predictable learning environment where routines add to the positive classroom culture. If expectations and routines are clear and consistently practiced with the appropriate consequence exercised, when there is a deviation, the student will be better supported. If students are well supported, it would not matter if we have 40 students in our classrooms. So in supporting SEN students within a class of 40, what helps is if there is clarity, consistency and consequence. That which we consider basic or common sense is core for effective teaching and can facilitate or impede teaching and learning. Expectations and routines of how we wish to start and end a lesson, handing in of work, ways to seek support and ask questions, movements from one place to another among other things would need to be clearly articulated and followed through for not just the SEN student, but all students. The ideas I'm sharing in the next segment are curated from work with the fraternity in two key areas that I lead at AST. Primarily, the Teacher Leader Network for SEN, as well as the SEN Chapter PD Series Workshops. So here are two examples for illustration. They are ideas gained from the SEN resource portal that participants in one of my workshops looked at in trying to make teaching accessible. So the table spotlights common instructional strategies that we use in our primary classrooms across various subjects. The teacher will usually spend some time planning for suitable instructional strategies based on the topic and objectives of the lesson. As various strategies, such as, for example, graphic organizers are included in the lesson to enhance engagement and learning, what would facilitate support for SEN students is to make the use of the strategy explicit and clear. So what helps is if we do not assume that students already know what and how, for example, a KWL chart is used. We would need to take the student through the KWL chart step by step 
so that expectations are also communicated. And for a student who may need many reminders, sometimes a visual cue card with a step-by-step -step for reference would be helpful, especially if this is a strategy that you use often in your teaching. In my classroom, I would do this for every student. So when you use it often enough, the student becomes familiar and just needs to refer to the cue card to support him or her, and you would not need to keep repeating instructions. So for SEN support, it's really not about having a very specialized set of skills and knowledge, but essentially about effective teaching where we show students how we expect them to engage in the teaching and learning in our classrooms. We may not need a new set of tricks in our bag, but a re-look at our current practices to make them accessible to not just some or most learners, but all learners. What may seem simple and common sense may not be that simple, or what we may think is no big deal can actually be a huge source of support for the student. So for older students, teachers who engaged the student in asking what works for him or her and what does not could actually make necessary tweaks to the instructional strategies that they used in their classrooms. So another common practice, especially in primary schools, is the use of files to store needed materials completed worksheets, assignments, etc. So students are expected at a very young age of seven to be able to file and sort their materials in lightning speed. Good filing methods is actually something students will gain as a life skill as they progress through the education system. So for a student who has issues with organizational skills, or in fact, any student in primary schools who may not have learned the skills of effective sorting, we would need to teach students by showing them how it is done. Whether we are using one file for all materials or three separate files or color-coded dividers, if we expect neatly sorted materials, we must teach so our students can learn. The idea of colored files or files with dividers clearly labeled in this example helps students organize their learning better. For the primary school student, it is effective if examples are provided or an actual demonstration of what is supposed to be done is actually done with the class. So I would do an actual demonstration of how this file with separators is to be used to sort and organize materials that are required for learning. This is an example which is extremely helpful for the student with deficits in organization and sometimes even coordination. But it will also help all other students manage their learning materials better. So for the oldest a student who's familiar with the use of such files, I may facilitate the use of this by including it in my instruction or in my teaching so that the student is reminded as well as does not feel out of place using a supposedly uncool file. So as we think about SEN support, it is useful if for the younger student, we as teachers, work with the parents or maybe even the allied educators who can support our work to teach the student explicitly how to use, for example, the file in this example that I've just given. So for students of all levels and streams, what is useful as we use resources such as this is if all teachers coming into the class use the same methods and actually sing the same song through the same practices. This helps with predictability and routine, which even an 18-year-old student with autism 
would probably still need. So what we are essentially doing is we are removing the distractors or what I call noise that may impede the learning. So as a teacher, I am making accessible the learning to you. I am making learning accessible by allowing you, my student, to focus on what I'm teaching so you can learn. I'm clearing all the noise and distractors in the way so that you can focus on my teaching and you can learn as I take you through. So what is crucial to note is that most of the students with SEN in our mainstream schools have the cognitive ability, but may just need clear, explicit instructions to help them better assess the learning. As we remove the distractors to learning, we are trying to also create a conducive learning environment where students feel safe and supported. Noise can be a huge trigger for some students or even some teachers. We often hear quiet, keep quiet, one silent clap, zip your mouth, finger on your lips, as ways that many primary school teachers try to get the class to quieten down. With that as our context, this idea was explored and found very effective in a class with more than half of the students with a range of SEN. Work could not take place in some subject classes, especially when the teacher had only one or two periods per week to get the curriculum across. So the form and co-form teacher actually unpacked what quiet actually meant and allowed for a range of constructive noise within the classroom for varying activities. Students now had the opportunity to talk but in varying loudness and were able to manage themselves better for learning to take place. So the idea was then shared with other teachers effectively. There are many versions of this idea, whether we call it a noisometer or volume control meter. The point is that there was clarity in the degree of loudness allowed consistency in its use, and clear consequences for the deviation. So this allowed all students access to the teaching and learning. This is another example used in the primary school. Give me five is used to remind students to get ready ahead of the lesson. The routine when practiced by all teachers with all students in a school actually aids the overall environment for learning, whether it's a subject teacher or a teacher coming in for relief of the class. Clear expectations become normalcy of behaviors and familiar routines, all right? So what also helps is when the teacher tweaks ideas to match their own beliefs and values. If I were to do this in my own classroom, I may remove the first point, eyes on speaker, especially if I have a student who is unable to maintain eye contact. What is more important to me is that the student is facing the direction of any material, screen or resource that is being used in the classroom. So I would remove the third point as it does not match my beliefs about child development as well. I may replace it with be at your seat. So as we reflect on support for SEN kids, reflect on support for our students, our core beliefs, our own personal core beliefs are essential. We would need to consider them as we reflect on our practices within our classrooms. So that makes the four C's to setting expectations and routines. I hope that this would ease recall as we continue to think about providing students with SEN better access to learning. So the four C's being clarity, consistency, consequence, anchored on your core beliefs. 
So as I reflect on the key to leading and advocating SEN support through effective pedagogy, the acronym SEN shouts out at me. It is a quick reminder of the essence of supporting a student with SEN in the classroom. The S reminds us of student-centered learning, one where we would provide a range of experiences, approaches, and strategies to support learning that centers around the student at the heart of all our actions and decisions. The E reminds us of explicit instruction, not leaving learning to assumptions, common sense, or even chance. And the end reminds us to provide needs-based support. Moving away from putting our students into rigid compartments according to what they cannot do or what their diagnosis suggests. Needs-based support would encourage us to include rather than exclude the uniqueness that abounds within our classrooms. So here is an example to illustrate the acronym SEN that I've just shared. For a class that comprises several students with challenging behaviours, one with autism, one with dyslexia, and another with vision issues, the teacher would need to consider providing a range of learning experiences that would allow for engaged learning. Worksheets, are purposefully created with consideration of the font size, the font type, and spacing between the lines. The text is framed within a box with line numbers to ensure that students can better assess the reading material. A visual cue card to remind students about paying mindful attention was also placed on each table for self-regulation. The cue card was created based on the needs of the students and is coupled with a reward with a gradual weaning off towards self-monitoring. For students who are able to communicate their needs, the teacher consulted them to ask what works and what does not. What is crucial is that desired behaviours are communicated and the student is made aware through a role play of what was expected of them. The explicit instruction ensured that the materials prepared were accessible and used optimally by the students. The cue card was used in the classroom as well as at home with varied reinforcements. When such a system is used consistently with a many helping hands approach, more challenging behaviors may be managed. Once the students are able to self-monitor and reduce off-task behaviours, they will be able to actually attend to the lesson. So the slant board was found to be useful for students with visual impairment. The angle of the slant board allowed the student to better assess the material. For this given example, the teacher provided any student who wanted to use the slant board the opportunity to use it if it aids their learning. So boards were made available for all students. Students shared that the slanted board and the boxed up text in the worksheet helped them focus on just the worksheet and nothing else on their tables. So what was intended for the SEN students provided needed support to other students as well. In the short time together today, I do hope that you have gained food for thought as I shared about our common language to the SCP and STP and how we can start by building a positive classroom culture, primarily in setting expectations and routines through clarity, consistency, and with consequences grounded on our core beliefs as we explore student-centered learning experiences and approaches based on needs that are explicitly and intentionally communicated. In the next few minutes, I will quickly share resources that can support the work that we are doing in our schools. This may be a refresher for some of you who are already very well versed. 
with some of the resources. So just bear with me. So this is an infographic that we sent out to all schools in April 2020. It covers four key areas that will be good to look at to ensure that students with SEN have better access to learning. The context for this infographic was to help provide support during HBL for students who seem to be coping well in the first week, but who started to struggle when there was a backlog of incomplete work and spaced out deadlines. So we gathered as a teacher leader group to identify barriers to online learning and realize that what would help the student actually cope better was one, clear daily schedules of what would be needed to be done. Ideas for a home timetable were also shared. Two, a step-by-step -step instruction numbered to help students understand what is required of them as some missed parts of required assignments and others provided their answers in forms that SLS was not able to accept. Three, to ensure accessibility through selection of accessible materials, whether it was closed captions on a video or font type or accents of foreign speakers that we needed to be mindful of in the selection of our materials. And four, one-on-one -on -one time where actually teachers were encouraged to check in so that they could gauge the type of support that students required. So the QR codes you see on this infographic would actually lead you to resources schools used, which you can actually tweak as needed. So if you're thinking about HBL, which is going to be a mainstay moving forward, the ideas and resources here may help you remove barriers that make so as to make learning accessible for all students. The next resource is Opal 2.0, which will house Sense Online PD modules, as well as micro learning units for SEN uh, to support professional development. The Aaron video that I showed at the beginning of today's session is part of three MLUs on Opal 2.0 under Building a Positive Classroom Culture. Each is about seven minutes long and educators can actually explore these on their own. The MLUs provide an insight into visual supports and calm down tools that can be explored when supporting students such as Aaron in Mr. Hakim's class. As SEN is one of the six pillars for skills future for educators, the SENSE online PD modules will provide the fraternity learning opportunities to enhance their PD journey in SEN support. So do look out for them. I often get asked what would be the best starting point for a journey of learning in SEN. My recommendation is the SEN resource portal. The portal houses a huge resource base. I would zoom in to explore the resources tab to understand or think about ideas. There are also links that you can explore. So I do hope you had the opportunity for reflective practice and that I've given you an assurance or reminder of what matters in SEN support. So whether we have 40 students or whether we are not trained in SEN specifically, what matters is that we anchor our practices on the fundamental belief that every child wants to and can learn given the right supports. With that, we will see the SCP come alive in our classrooms and schools. Teachers have affirmed that when we hold the student at the center of all that we do, we can create little ripples of positive change in our own ways. It is my hope and that of many others that our learners with SEN can gain full access to instruction within a positive classroom culture that includes rather than excludes. So with that, I thank you for the honor of sharing my thoughts with you. Do email me if you have any questions or further thoughts, comments, suggestions, or should you need any support at all for the student with SEN. Thank you.